You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin, Ether, Solana, Doge, and more. Cryptocurrencies and digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity, provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments throughout the world's leading crypto derivatives markets. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on The Crypto Rundown. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of crypto derivatives. It's time for The Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again on the Crypto Rundown, the program here on the network where we go a little bit above and beyond our traditional stomping grounds. Not going to talk about your Apple, your Tesla, or your VIX, or SPY options here. Nope. Going to talk more about what's cooking on the crypto derivatives front, the volume, the volatility, the skew, the unusual activity, and a whole bunch more. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the THE optionsinsider.com, as well as from the network upon which so many of you folks are mainlining these days. Hope you're having a good start to your trading week out there. Remember, if you like what you hear, this show, anything else on the network. You know, I keep thinking of this show as the, the new addition to the network, even though this, this show has been running since, I think, 2018. So it's one of the newer additions. The network, of course, as a whole, goes all the way back to the primordial pre-iPhone days of 2007, so 17 plus years here on the old network. So you like this show, anything else that we do on the network, throw a like, a star, a comment. It does help the literal legion of new people who are discovering the content every day these days, helps them beat a path to our door. Of course, for all you crypto native folks who are coming in, maybe a little bit less savvy on the options front, make sure you're checking out the rest of the network content, including our options boot camp, options playbook radio, two great educational content sources for you folks out there, help you get up to speed make you a little bit more familiar with some of the terms we throw around out here, like skew and volatility and all the things I was just talking about out there. And of course, if you want to go above and beyond, you want to join us for pro Q and A's, which these days overlap into the world of crypto and volatility quite a bit, as well as of course, options, oddities, giveaways, live streams, all sorts of fun. The options insider.com slash pro the place to go to learn more. As we go on into our first segment, it is time to roll out the crypto hot seat. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the, the crypto, crypto Hot, hot seat. seat. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Crypto Hot Seat, the portion of the show where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of crypto derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, 
the listener. And next up on the old program is a newcomer to the hot seat and indeed to the network. He is Matt Williams, the head of derivatives at Luxor Technology. Matt, welcome to the Crypto Rundown program. Thank you very much for having me. The intro to your show is amazing, by the way. I feel like I'm a wrestler coming into a cage match. Can't go wrong with a little bit of entrance music, right? Why not have a little bit of fun? Uh, a wrestling, 100%. wrestling music going on over here. Uh, but Mr. Matt, we could talk wrestling the whole show. But uh, this is your first time on the network. Why don't you go ahead and give our audience a bit of an overview of your background in the world of crypto and indeed derivatives, sir. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm a longtime traditional finance guy. Started off my career as an energy trader, uh, futures and options. Um, traded Henry Hub, traded WTI. Um, came back to Chicago, where I'm from. Um, traded at the Board of Trade and the Ag, um, soybeans, corn, wheat, you name it. Uh, went to work for Option City for a while, actually, on the product side of things. And then uh, went over to CME Group, where I was in the corporate strategy team. Uh, was part of the team that helped launch Bitcoin Futures back in a long time ago, in 2017 now. And then um, I've spent two years at the NFA, and I've been at Luxor now for two years as well, uh, helping build out the hash rate derivatives markets for the Bitcoin mining world. You've worn a lot of hats, including regulator. I have to be careful what I say around you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well-rounded. <laughs> but we could, we could talk the rest of the show about WTI, if you like. A lot going on out there. And, of course, the Bitcoin futures and options over there at CME. But we won't do that. We'll dive into all the fun stuff you guys have cooking over there at Luxor Tech. Give our listeners an overview. This is the first time your firm's been on the network as well. What the heck is Luxor Tech? What do you guys do over there? We do a lot. Uh, I like to say we're the glue in the mining community. So first and foremost, we're a, a large mining pool, uh, you, one of the biggest in North America. Um, and from there, we have a we view the mining pool as more of like the glue of our organization. It's the ecosystem builder. Um, and then from there, we do we help people buy and sell ASICs, the hardware needed to mine Bitcoin. Um, we have a big burgeoning firmware business. Obviously, the derivatives business that I run, which is um, primarily OTC markets right now, but we're venturing into the listed space later this month. Um, and then also at, at Luxor, we, we have a logistics business. We basically provide all the tools to the mining community in order for them to be successful. I'd be listening right now saying, why a mining tech company? Why do they have a head of derivatives? What is going on over there on the derivatives front? So let's get into that. Uh, you guys are working to commoditize and indeed create derivatives around some, I think to put it mildly, unique asset classes, in particular, the hash rate and the computing power behind the mining world out there. So walk our listeners through that. What exactly are you building these derivatives around over there? Yeah, yeah. For, to take a step back and kind of paint a picture, because um, the reason we built these derivatives was to fill an unmet unmet need for the space. So when you look at the miner, like a Bitcoin miner, um, mid-tier, small, large-scale, public, they all have the same risk exposures. So, you know, a lot of these you'll be familiar and your listeners will be familiar with. It all starts with energy. So energy costs are a huge input into the success of a miner. Um, and as you know, there's lots of energy derivatives that exist to mitigate that risk. The second piece is their treasury. So Bitcoin miners, you know, one of the main purposes is to acquire Bitcoin, hold Bitcoin, but you have a lot of price exposure with that. And there's also um, a plethora of Bitcoin derivatives that exist. Um, Binomial has a physically settled future. You mentioned CME. You know, there's some other options that exist, a lot of other options that exist as well. Now, the third risk exposure that miners have is their revenue. Um, and there's a lot of volatility within their revenue. And the reason is that because the revenue is tied to Bitcoin price, it's tied to network difficulty, and it's tied to transaction fees. And all those kind of form together into this one component known as hash price. Now, a hash price can fluctuate based on those three components pretty wildly. And previously, um, there wasn't any derivatives that existed to mitigate that risk. Now, the reason I think you asked the question of why Luxor. The reason why Luxor is, um, A, we're, we're well-established and well-respected in the community. B, we have an established index that tracks that hash price. Um, and it's, you know, 
well used within the space. It's, uh, it's been recognized long before I got here. And very much like other products, we've built derivatives around that index. And so that's why we have the right to win. That's why we launched these you know, first ever compute power derivatives. And, and that's why we've had some success. Well, you learn from your days at CME, it helps to have the underlying index first, right? And then you create, <laughs> you create the products around that. Speaking of the products, sounds like you have uh, one in the offing and one that's cooking right now. You offer forwards and you're about to list futures. Is that correct, Matt? Yeah, we actually have two um, that are live. So we have a, a non-deliverable forward. Um, so basically it tracks that index, allows miners to lock in their their expected value of their hash rate for a given amount of size and time. And then we have a physical forward, which basically allows miners to sell their forward production, uh, much like you would in any other commodity space, and get Bitcoin up front. And they'll use that you know, advance on their forward production to buy more machines, pay down debt, uh, pay off energy costs, uh, and so on. So those two are well-established. And the third that you reference is the futures contract, which we're launching in partnership with Binomio um, later this month. Tell us a little more about that listed contract that is coming up. What are some of the specs, the size, who is the, the target end user for this new listed future? Yeah, so it, it's very closely aligned to our forward contract. And so the basic premise is, it, 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 again, it, it tracks the index that I referenced, the hash price index. The hash price index will show you the expected value of one petahash of hash rate on a daily basis. So for example, um, and this is topical as well, before the halving that occurred a couple of days ago, you could expect to earn around $100 per petahash of hash rate that you have on a daily basis. You know, after the block reward um, was halved, that's changed quite a bit. But effectively, what the contract, the minimum contract size is one petahash. Um, the durations can be anywhere from one day out to six months. Um, on the and that's on the forward side. On the futures, we'll have monthly contracts. We'll have the first three listed, first three months listed, and then the plan is to do quarterlies beyond that. And um, and then yes, yeah, so the minimum increments will be down to the quarter dollar in in hash price and settle daily to our index. Now, on the surface, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It's no no different than what we're seeing in a lot of other commodity type markets where there is a producer like you used to work in WTI. You know, a lot of the producers on that side like to hedge their exposure in the crude oil market, any other big commodity market. They like to hedge that exposure. It makes sense. So it makes sense that the miners would have the same use case. We saw a lot of firms dive into this marketplace a few years ago, very specifically with physically settled and physically deliverable contracts. I'm thinking a few off the top of my head, Ledger X and their early incarnation backed, of course, I made a big deal launching the first ever physically delivered contract out there. A lot of people were going after this space, specifically for the miners, because they thought the demand was going to be on the physically settled side. It seems like in the last few years, a lot of that has changed and people are moving away from the physically settled more towards uh, the cash settle for a variety of reasons. It's appeals to a wider audience. It's a little bit more straightforward. I'm curious for you, particularly for the mining audience that you're going after, are they still predominantly interested in the physically settled, physically delivered contracts, or are they also starting to migrate towards the cash settled stuff? Uh, well, it's an interesting question because like, we actually started on the cash settled side of things first. So the NDF is cash settled, and that can be either denominated in dollars or Bitcoin. Um, for us, it was just a more elegant path to launch. But the feedback we got over time um, with that contract was we actually prefer physical. And, and that's dependent on who you're talking to. And the use cases can vary on physical versus cash and on why you would want that. But so that was actually the impetus behind us launching a physical contract is we had so much um, requests for it that we're like, all right, well, we should definitely look into this. And so, but it's, you know, it's a mix. To be honest, like 50% of our volume is in the cash and 50% is in the physical. And I think the reason is, you know, for the cash, the primary use case from a mining perspective is just pure hedge, right? Like you lock in a price for a certain amount of time and, and in size, whereas in the physical, you know, it's a different use case, at least for the miners. Like they're using that asset to get, you know, better financing to fund operations or, or growth. And, um, 
you know, it's just, it's just this different output, but I think, you know, longer term, it's really going to depend on who you're talking to and what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, it definitely varies with the use case. I was surprised that the physically settled didn't really take off as much as people anticipated. It made a lot of sense to me. You know, miners coming in, they're sitting on a boatload of Bitcoin, for example. Maybe they want to write some covered calls against that and have them be taken away at the end of it. It makes a lot of sense for a lot of users out there. Uh, for whatever reason, it seems like it kind of uh, got a little stuck in the weeds, but it sounds like for your use case and for your audience out there, the miners in particular, they are still interested in that physically settled, which again, it makes a lot of sense. Of course, we are talking right now. You just referred to it, Matt, at a very uh, interesting time to be talking about hash rates and computing powers and all that fun because all of that is changing. What am I talking about? Of course, I'm talking about the having. It seems like, Matt, we have reached that tipping point. You know, there's that old saying in the traditional financial markets, when your cabbies and your, your barbers, whoever it is, when they're all talking about something, maybe we've it's reached saturation. And certainly every one of them other has been talking about Bitcoin having, even people who aren't crypto native, shall we say, are all, all a Twitter, <laughs> all a buzz about the Bitcoin having. So obviously an interesting time to be looking at things like hash price, how specifically does this having impact you guys and your hash rate futures and forwards going forward, Matt? I honestly think, you know, it's nice that we're past the having now, right? Because now we don't have to talk about like what's going to happen. Now we, we kind of see what's happening. You happening. are legally obligated to talk about it for the next six months, sir, I believe. <laughs> I probably have to talk about it for the next four years, right? Because now it's the next having that we're going to talk about. But, um, I, you know, honestly, I think it, for our business, um, for the mining space, it's it's super relevant um, because now, you know, your your block reward is cut in half. Your profitability, you know, while not necessarily cut in half, has taken a huge hit. And now, you know, the mining space, is, as it evolves, has to get more thoughtful and strategic around how you manage margins. And I think derivatives are a logical next step for people to get uh, onboarded to. And, and it kind of ties into your last question of, you know, why not physical or why cash settled? And the truth is, you know, the mining space, it's very young, you know, it's less than 10 years and they're, they haven't traditionally been exposed to the derivatives world. So there's still a huge learning curve for the, for the whole space in terms of what do derivatives add value to my organization? And, and historically speaking, miners hadn't hedged much in the way of any of their risk exposures. But now it's getting to the point where, you know, they're starting to follow, you know, the oil producer model where it's like, you know, you, you have to hedge out a, a sizable portion of your production in order to remain solvent and have more predictable free cash flow and get be better financing and so on. And so there's a, you know, we're seeing it. Lots of public miners are onboarding to our platform. We're getting tons of interest. People are educating themselves. And so it's very topical. And so I think, you know, we're in a good place having launched these and established these products. And now we're starting to see a huge volume growth and participation. Well, that volume growth certainly is interesting because you've been around the derivative space for a while. You know, we operate in the traditional world of options and volatility and VIX, and people still dispute the notion of volatility being a separate asset class, even though VIX is out there putting up nearly a million options contracts a day. So the people are, are slow to embrace change out there. What has the response been so far to these new uh, hash rate derivatives? Are the miners and maybe some other audiences, are they starting to come on board? Yeah, for sure. And a lot of it comes down to managing that volatility. Like you, I'm sure you've talked a lot about, you know, Bitcoin volatility and everyone's very well versed on, on what that looks like. But for a miner, Bitcoin isn't the only input to the revenue. There's also, you know, changes in difficulty and more recently transaction fees. Now, transaction fees, you know, from a mining perspective and modeling out your revenue has been flat for a very long time. Up until recently with the introduction of ordinals and, and layer two developments, there's a big battle for block space, which in turn leads to higher uh, transaction fees and high, high volatility in transaction fees. So what that means on a daily basis, miners are seeing extreme volatility in their profitability. And so, you know, and that's concerning. And so you have to be able to mitigate that and manage that. And I think that's why these derivatives are, you know, you know, we've already seen a modicum of success, but I think they're about to blow up exponentially. You mentioned that some volume, as you put it, the modicum of success, what kind of volumes are we looking at right now in the early offing here? 
Yeah, so we haven't like we haven't posted a ton of volume numbers, but I can say from you know we measured things quarter over quarter, and then in terms of like more some more of a liquidity story. But we've two x each quarter since launch, and then in January alone, I think we three x Q4 in January. Um, and so the volume that we're doing is huge. We've onboarded tons of participants, but from a liquidity perspective, you know you look at how much hash rate a miner has. And how much they, how, what percentage of that they can hedge, and so from a liquidity perspective, we can comfortably provide liquidity to the top miners, you know, up to about 30%. We expect that to double within the next couple of months. So we're we're in the several exahash of size, with one petahash being like the minimum increment, um, which is tremendous growth for this. And it's always, you know, as you know in these markets, it's a chicken and egg game. It's like People don't want to come in until there's volume and liquidity. We're finally to that point where like, we can say, hey, we have it. Come in, see the market, and, um, and trade it. You know, it's interesting. We're talking a lot about the miners and their end use case. And we certainly have a lot of those in our audience. In fact, uh, I'll let you in on a little secret, Matt. When we first launched this show, we're used to all of our shows being very popular in the major market centers around the globe and here in the U.S., of course. So your New York's, your Chicago's, all your other big major market centers, you know, London to Frankfurt around the globe. Uh, with this show, when we launched it, it was super popular in far rural Kentucky, far eastern Washington state, places where at the time the biggest mining operations were. And then lo and behold, those were the early adopters on the crypto derivatives front. And of course, now the audience has spread to encompass a wide variety of people out there. So we certainly do have that core audience of miners out there who are interested in hedging what about for anybody else out there matt what about some other use cases maybe some other end users are people coming over there to luxor and trading these things who aren't miners and if so what are they using them for yeah that's a great question um so what i like to say to that question is this instrument gives you almost synthetic exposure to the mining space so if you want to get into mining, you want to participate in exposure in the mining, but you don't want to buy a bunch of machines and a data center um, and, and you know manage all those problems that I talked about earlier, these instruments give you that synthetic exposure to the mining space. It, it also, you know, from our physically delivered forward, it gives you a, you know the ability to buy discounted hash rate, and then you can participate in the rewards that would come through our pool. Um, from the future side. It, you know, it also gives you exposure to that volatility I was talking about. There's arbitrage opportunities. There's ways, you know, for the equity holders of public mining stocks, you can use this as a hedge, uh, you know, against those. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time talking to crypto native hedge funds, market makers, prop groups, you know, basically all the people that I used to talk to in my TradFi days and kind of show them, hey, this gives you exposure to Bitcoin with a different volatility profile. Um, and kind of gives you a way to, you know, you can, it's unique because it's not just Bitcoin. It's, you know, what I mentioned before, transaction fees and network difficulty. So for the people that, you know, are well-versed in that space and can forecast and model those, it's, it's a really interesting product. Um, and to be honest, it's not, it, it hasn't been a hard sell for us, you know, for people outside of the mining world, just due to that unique nature of it. So there are speculators coming to play in this, which, again, it is intriguing. I know people who are out there trading in different crypto assets already, I could certainly see them be intrigued by this. Speaking of which, you mentioned the volatility profile. I'm curious, what is the volatility profile of the hash rate? We all know on this show, at least, that Bitcoin hovers around a 70 vol right now. It's gotten up, obviously, north of uh, triple digits. And then not that long ago, it was down in the 20s. So it's had quite a range of volatility. What are we looking at from a vol profile for your, your hash price index there, Matt? Yeah, we're, we're almost in like we're in the Henry Hub vol profile. We're definitely above Bitcoin. And a lot of that has to do with these transaction fee spikes that we've seen recently. So our vol is well above 70, well, well above it. And so you know, and but that's not always the case. Like you, you'll see um, peaks and valleys with the the volatility due to transaction fees and, and Bitcoin price. So, you know, it used to be for a while when transaction fees were pretty constant that we had a fairly high beta to Bitcoin vol, but that's not the case anymore. We're, we're definitely higher. Interesting. More vol than Bitcoin. I think that's music to a lot of our listeners' ears out there, Matt. Uh, well, Matt, I appreciate you joining us here today on the Crypto Hot Seat. Give us a little bit of an overview, an introduction, if you will, to your hash rate futures. You mentioned 
listed futures coming down the pike soon. So give our listeners a little bit more of an update time frame, what they can expect on that front. And then anything else you guys and gals have in the hopper you want to share with our audience coming down the pike from you folks over there at Luxor. And now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, futures are imminent. We're just waiting for final approval from the CFTC on some of our margin stuff. Um, any day now is literally the answer. It could be a, a week or two. And then um, we're immediately uh, going to look into options afterwards. I think it's a natural progression from that. Um, we're super keen to kind of explore more of the energy space and then transaction fees, uh, just due to the volatility I mentioned, we're, we're looking into transaction fee derivatives and what those could look like as a way for, you know, not just miners, but anyone that's exposed to transaction fees, I think would be interested in a product where they can either gain more exposure or, or mitigate their existing exposure. Wow, not just one new asset class. You're not settling for one, Matt. You're going for multiples out here. So uh, I'm definitely intrigued. You mentioned the magic word, which is options. So we'll definitely have to bring you folks back on down the road to talk about that in more detail down the road. Before we go, if folks are intrigued about any of this stuff and they want to find out more, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, go to luxor.tech slash derivatives. Um, We'll show you everything you need. And, um, yeah, we have lots of data at hashrateindex.com as well. All the metrics that I talked about, we have several indices. We've put out tons of research, blog posts, forecasting, you name it. We're very research-heavy uh, in this in this organization. Well, check them out, listeners. And, Matt, we'll have to bring you guys and gals back on down the road to look at the futures and talk about the upcoming options, which you know our audience will be interested in as well, Matt. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me on the show. And now, listeners, it is time to keep on rolling a little bit of the old Bitcoin breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trending activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the The Bitcoin Bitcoin Breakdown. Breakdown. All right, listeners, let's get to it. How'd you like that, huh? Potentially a new derivatives market on the crypto front for your perusal. A little bit more vol, even. Than Bitcoin, which is always intriguing. But let's get to the big dog right now, which is Bitcoin coming in to start the show a little bit bigger than it was at this time last week. We were at 63,678 on the show last week, 64,397 at the start of the show today, up a whopping 719 handles on the week. So all this having noise, driving a lot of sturm und drang out there, but it's netting out to a little bit more upside on the week. Uh, the high came pretty much today, earlier, right before showtime. We got up to 66,591. So we've come off a wee bit uh, since then, which is kind of interesting. Guess to that conversation everyone's having right now about stocks going 24-7. You know, we traditionally see a lot of the peaks and valleys on the Bitcoin price and ETH as well, usually coming in the less liquid hours, the, the far after hours, or perhaps on the weekends when traditional markets are closed. Today's a rare day where we're seeing the high coming today. But intriguing stuff, you know, crypto folks have been dealing with 24-7 for a while. Is that something that should come to stocks as well? Huh? Maybe we'll get to that a little bit later. The low came last Wednesday, 61,260. So we threatened 60K again. Didn't quite get there to the dark side. We were just talking about Vol with the folks over there at Luxor and their hash rate derivative. Let's see what's going on from a Vol perspective on the Bitcoin mothership, shall we? Let's start seven day and work our way out as we are wont to do. And coming into the start of the show, I said Bitcoin's kind of hovering around a 70. That's pretty much the case. On the show last week, we were at a 71 in the seven-day vol. This week, coming in a little bit, 67 and a half. Going out a little bit farther, 30 days, a more standardized volatility metric. That is literally unched on the week, 68 last week, 68 this week. So no change, no joy there. And going out a little bit farther, 180 days, six months. We were at a 75 and a half on the last show, 73 this week. So coming in a little bit. But Holdler is still going to hodl, bidding up that long-term vol just a little bit. Let's get out to the skew and see what's going on. Remember, we've kind of been vacillating a little bit, including rallying and then coming off even uh, earlier today. So that's going to be reflected in that seven-day skew, which was negative six this time last week. Remember, we were kind of falling out of bed this time last week. Now that that has mitigated somewhat, we're seeing that coming in a little bit. It's still negative, but negative two and a half. So not quite as pronounced as it was this time last week. 30-day skew again. Things are looking uh, pretty interesting. We were negative two on the show last week. Most of that's gone. It's pretty much flat now. It's pretty much zero. 
So no bias in any direction on 30-day skew, which maybe shows us maybe we're going to settle out here for a little bit or maybe the market just taking a pause, a breath, calm before the storm. Listeners, going out six months, you know the deal. It's going to be a bid to the upside. That is the case again this week. Three and a half points, that's what it was this week. 3.4 points last week, so not a heck of a lot of evolution there. Let's get out to maybe your favorite, maybe your least favorite, I don't know, uh, in terms of optionable securities that play in the crypto waters out there. Let's talk about Bitto first. Again, it's the more one-to-one. We have other products out there like your Maras and all kinds of other things that have, let's say, less one-to-one correlation with the price of Bitcoin. Bitto getting a little bit of its mojo back this week. 29 even when we kicked off the show, up 1.4 points. Uh, The ADV going in the wrong direction, though, down to 102,000 contracts. That's down about 12,000 from this time last week. In terms of today, looking pretty decent today. So you're probably going to hit that today. We were at 91,000 at the start of the show. That's down about 13,000 as well. I'm sure if I re-racked that right now, let's see if we're caught up. Yeah, we're at almost 120,000 right now, 119,000. So the volume starting to pick up in the last half hour here of the day or so. So we'll see. We'll see if we can, uh, how high we can get out there, listeners. Let's look really quickly and see what's lighting up the tape out there today in Bitto. It's 14,000 of the 31 calls expiring this week. And it passed its prologue, folks. People are probably buying those. Let's take a look. Oh, no, actually, they did, they did a spread out there today. Let's see. So maybe they're rolling a little bit. Listen, let's see. It was, I looks like it was the April 29, 31 call spread expiring this Friday, going up for 63 cents paper, buying 8,000 of... The 29 selling 8,000 of the 31s. And then weirdly enough, looks like also selling 8,000 of the 31 calls for 51 cents, which if that is the case, either they're getting net short a lot of units to the upside, that 51 cents will wipe out most of the cost of that upside. That could be a little bit of the stock repair trade as well. Bitto sold off a little bit. If you own some Bitto right now, you buy that one vertical and then you sell an additional 8,000 to the upside a little bit farther out, out going out to, this is May 3rd, so one week later. Now, if you own the underlying, underlying rallies, you buy the vertical, it's effectively buying that vertical for almost nothing. So that does look like a bit of a stock repair trade in which case the underlying rallies, you get your bid o called away, your vertical looks pretty good, it goes out at max value, so you make some money back there, you get your underlying called away with the second short units you have there, and you actually lower your break-even points. Maybe this person came in and bought bid o 35, somewhere in that range, and they want to try to make it back now. But it looks like a lot of funky spreads going up out there today, listener, which again is, is kind of part of the fun. Also, we have a May... Iron Condor going up. Don't see that too often. The May 28, 31, 32, 36 Iron Condor going up 5,000 times. <laughs> Unfortunately, only one of those looks like the 31s are opening. But again, we'll have to check again later on this week when we know all the OI story. Going up for 72 cents. It's like paper may be selling that. So they're probably selling the 31 and 32, which is very tight. It's a very tight Iron Condor. Oh, it's a call condor. It's all calls. <laughs> wow. Don't see that too often as well. So it's a call condor going up for 72 cents. Wow. Oh, funky paper out there in Bitto today. Either way, all that adds up to 119,000. I'm getting sucked down the rabbit hole of this paper, listeners. We have to keep rolling. Uh, the vol right now, 67, down about three points. So again, Bitcoin kind of across the board hovering around that 70 vol level right now. If you're wondering what is the big dog position in Bitto options right now, it is still... The Jan 30s, 106,000 contracts open there. Let's keep on rolling out to Mara. 17 and a quarter right now, up exactly two bucks from where it was this time last week. You know, this bad boy continues to deliver from a vol perspective. The vol is 115. I mean, coming in five points, it's still 115. It's still a ridiculous vol level. You can be hard pressed to find a lot of assets that can compare to Mara from a vol perspective. Even other very volatile things, Bitcoin. Natural gas, they're all around the 70s, mid-60s for nat gas. Not going to touch a 115 here in Mara. By the way, volume, 276,000 contracts on the tape right now. So it looks like 
they are beating that ADB of right around a quarter of a million, which has come in about 20,000. I got a feeling this time next week is going to be a little bit higher. Let's look really quickly and see what the folks are up to out there today. Oh, jeez. Just opening on every strike across the board, it seems like, including 17,300 of the 17 calls expiring this week, which, again, those are already in the money. Those are looking pretty good. And 15,000 of the 18 calls also expiring this week. And then that's not far enough out of the money for you listeners. 12,000 of the 20 calls expiring this week. My goodness, a lot of weekly action out here. It's like people were buying those 17s for around a buck earlier this morning. Bought some for 41 cents and three quarters of a buck as well. But it seems like the size went up around a dollar. Dollar for the 17s. Oh, they got a ways to go then. They're 27 cents in the money right now. <laughs> they don't need to get the bit in its teeth and keep rolling for those calls, make, let alone the 20s. Hit the 20 by the end of the week, listeners. I don't know. You like those? Let's look really quickly. See where those went up. 21 to 23 cents. Actually, they traded 28 cents at one point. 28 cents for the 20s. Wow. Stock was 1730 at the time. So right around here. You like those listeners? I got a feeling they're a little bit cheaper now than they were at 28 cents. My goodness. Wow. All that paper. Uh, in terms of size positions, it's the June 30s, nearly 27,000 of those. Those have a ways to go, but you got some time. So intriguing stuff. But speaking of time, we're coming up against it already. Time to keep going into the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe. All right, everybody, let's do it. Let's get to the altcoin universe. We're talking about volatility. We should do volatility of market cap in crypto, and particularly the bottom half of the top 10. It's a very volatile place to be. Uh, number 10 this week, we've got Cardano holding down that spot at $18.4 billion. Again, that's lower than it has been of late, but still roughly $10 billion higher than what it was not too long ago to break into the top 10. The top 10 was hanging out around seven and a half, eight billion for a long time. So 18.4 billion to break into the top 10. Nothing to sneeze at. That gets us to our old pal Cardano. Number nine, it's TonCoin. What the hell is TonCoin? We've talked to a bunch of people about it. Yet to get a straight answer about it. Kind of fun. Either way, 20.9 billion worth of market cap out there. So can 20.9 billion in market cap be wrong? Well, We've seen it with Luna and others in the past, but uh, intriguing. Number nine, TonCoin. Number eight, it's the Doge fighting its way back up to the number eight spot. $23.2 billion worth of market cap. So it continues to fight it out with TonCoin this week. Doge taking the number eight spot. Number seven is XRP. Look, recovering a little bit on the week. We'll get to that more when we talk about the price action. $30 billion exactly for XRP. Number six, it's USD coin, $34 billion. Number five, old pal Solana. Getting back some of its mojo as well. 69.3 billion. Number four, BNB, 88.2 billion. Numero Trace, its tether, 109.9 billion to be precise. Number two, you know what it is? It's E384.6 billion. And the big dog, Bitcoin, still north of 1T, 1.31 trillion worth of market cap. Any surprises in there for you listeners? Are you surprised Tuncoin still holding in? Are you surprised Doge fought its way to number eight? Hit us up, let us know as you get on out to number two in market cap, number one in a lot of your hearts. It's ETH. Pretty much 3,200 as we kicked off the show. 3,199 to be precise. A buck shy right as we kicked off the show. It was at 3,092 this time a week ago. It's up a whopping 107 handles on the week. The high was also 3,199 right as we started the show. And the low came last Wednesday. Broke through 3K again down to 2,982. Volwise 70 is the magic number this week, listeners. We were at a 78 and a quarter on the seven day vol in ETH last week. This week, 70 exactly. 70.0. Everybody loves a good 70. Uh, 30 day vol in ETH, 70 and a quarter. <laughs> Coming down from 71 and a quarter a week ago. And then 180 day vol, 77 and two thirds. That's unchanged from this time last week. Skew, as you might expect, a little bit of evolution on the seven-day skew front. Negative two and a half this week, negative seven and a half last week. So obviously far less bearish than it was this time a week ago. But that can also change intraday depending on where we're vacillating around. And ETH listeners, 30-day skew last week was a negative four. So everything was looking pretty bearish last week. This week, still negative, but negative two and a half. So only slightly negative. And going out to the six-month skew, you know it's positive. But that's coming in a little bit as well. It's about three and two-thirds 
last week, this week, two and three quarters. So coming in, but not quite a full point. Let's get out to our old friend Solana having an ice resurgence this week. 137 and a half this time a week ago. 154 and a half this week. Up a whopping 17 handles on the week. So Solana getting the bit in its teeth, the wind in its sails again. Is that reflected in the vol? The answer is no. The vol last week, seven-day vol, 138. This week, 121. So coming in a wee bit, about 17 points. Let's go out 30 days. Again, a more standardized vol metric, 117. This week, 127 last week. So coming in 10 points out there, which is kind of interesting, maybe indicative that Solana is showing some bias to the downside from a skew perspective, which looking at the numbers for last week, that is the case. Again, if you're rallying and vols coming in, that's more of a traditional equity type skew where the calls are discounted, the puts are bid. Looks like that was the way it was. And Solana may be changing up this week. Let's see if the numbers back that up. And the answer is yes. A seven-day skew it was negative eight, so very, very negative on the show last week, which, again, makes sense. Solana was nearly 70 points off its high, so it makes sense. Folks would be looking to the dark side. This week, that is gone. It is exactly flat, so maybe we're hanging out at some equilibrium right now on the Solana. Seven-day front, 30-day skew. Last week was flat. That's kind of surprising. Uh, this week has swung to the upside again, positive, which makes sense. Rallying 17 handles on the week. Nearly a positive seven, six and three quarters. Uh, XRP, our old friend, getting a little bit of his mojo back. 49 cents last week, 54 cents this week. So rallying a full nickel. Does that make up for it, all you XRP holders? Man, you folks are the longest suffering folks in crypto out there. I feel for you. Dogecoin, 15 and a half cents last week, 16 cents this week, up a whopping, whopping half a cent. Not a heck of a lot going on in Dogecoin this week. And then let's go out to a few others out there before we wrap up for this week. Cardano, 44.7 cents last week, 51 cents this week's so up almost 7 cents on the week. Polkadot, 6.58 last week, 7.46 this week, up 88 cents. And everybody's favorite, Shiba Inu, giving up some of the ghosts. A million zeros, 2.6 last week, this week, a million zeros, 2.1. As we keep on rolling really quickly into, let's say, a crypto-related question. You've got questions about crypto. Who doesn't? It's time to find out the answers to your crypto questions. All right, everybody, welcome to the crypto questions. I just want to get your thoughts on this before we keep rolling. Like I said, I teased it at the top of the show. It is a crypto related, a crypto adjacent question, which just went live right before our option block show earlier this morning. It's all the rage in the stock world right now. NYSE actually polling their members out there as well saying, should we go 24-7 on the stock front or maybe 24-5 or not do it at all on the stock front? Obviously a very contentious issue, people on both sides of this conversation. And one of the best analogies for people to point to is, of course, the crypto market. Crypto market has been trading 24-7 pretty much since inception. You know, it wasn't really created in a traditional financial model. So the old rules of opening bells and closing bells and specialist hours and all that kind of stuff never really came into consideration. They said, we're going to make a tradable asset that's going to trade 24-7. That's what our audience wants. That's what we're here for. And it's never really looked back. And so crypto moves all the time. Stocks, obviously, a little bit of a different beast. They have an opening bell. You have a closing bell. If you get into the world of futures, things get a little bit closer to the 24-7 model out there. Uh, so you have kind of your half steps in between. But the traditional underlying, there's a few hours of after hours here or there, but really the traditional underlying, it has an opening and a closing bell, and that's kind of it. Do you think that time has come? Are those days numbered? Is it time for stocks to trade 24 hours a day? Right now we're asking our audience. They are the ultimate arbiters. Again, this just went live about an hour and change ago. But so far the folks are already pretty heated in their responses <laughs> uh should they trade 24 hours a day stocks yes or no overwhelmingly nearly 75 percent 74.2 percent of you coming in saying a hot no 25.8 percent saying yes so wow no uh, no love for this one out here at all in terms of other replies we're getting, we got Everyman Smith saying he traded crypto back in the early, early days. And once the bots got the handle on the 24 hours, it became a nightmare of wondering what you'd wake up to every day. For me, it would seem to be a big and irreversible mistake. So 
lot of people taking the lessons learned from crypto and trying to apply them retroactively back to the stock market, saying, no, don't go there. We don't want that. You know, I can see both sides of this. I've been in the markets for a while. People always argue to us on the options front during earnings season in particular, oh, we want to have the options open during the after hours for stocks so we can capture some of these crazy earnings moves. That makes a modicum of sense, I think, especially during earnings season. But 24-7, you know, there is something to be said for hitting the pause button. Look at the last couple of weekends in particular in the markets. We've seen very literal weekend risk playing out in the Middle East. The fact that the major markets weren't open during those times, probably a good thing. You're not getting a lot of those vacillations you would see during those crazy hours. Also, on the weekends, in the after hours, those sessions are notoriously illiquid. So that's where you get a lot of price action that, I think to put it charitably, it's not really reflective of the underlying economic sentiment of the broad market out there. Look at crypto. We, how many times do we see the highs and lows coming on the weekends or in the less liquid sessions out there? Because that's when things can move because they're very illiquid. So I can see a benefit to hitting that pause button. I mean, personally, I like the fact that I could stop at a certain point. <laughs> There's something to be said for not having to be glued to your markets all the time. We talk about work-life balance in the trading world. It's the same thing. You want to have some balance with your family, your friends, doing other things. You don't want to be glued to your device showing you your quotes all the time. So I could see an argument for it. We obviously have a lot of hardcores in our audience who would love to have it. But clearly, the majority of you right now saying a resounding no. I'm curious, folks, what is your thought on this? Get out there at Options. Just went live a few hours ago. It's our question of the week. So it's been running throughout the week. So whenever you're listening to this this week, Make sure you get on over to add options on the old Twitter slash X and make your voice heard. If you're one of the many coming in weeks, months, years down the road listening to this, then by all means, you should still be visiting us over there at options. <laughs> Probably some great polls there and other great content you could find over there as well. Great content on the website as well, theoptionsinsider.com. And of course, while you're there, you can check out all the rest of our shows. And of course, head on over to the old pro where we have some very cool exclusive stuff hanging out there for our pro members, including a lot of great pro Q&As that do touch on a lot of the crypto and volatility landscapes. If you have questions about those, we've already done a lot of great pro Q&A sessions about that. You can check them out for yourselves, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. I want to thank the folks over there at Luxor Technology for joining us today. You can find out more at Luxor, L-U-X-O-R dot tech, or just follow them on Twitter at Luxor Technology, all one word. And of course, all of our data on the show comes from our friends over there at Amber Data. Amberdata.io, the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. Remember, if you like what you hear on the network, reach out to the sponsors on the shows and say, hey, you know, we're happy you're supporting the network. Kick the tires and light the fires. Maybe you'll like it. And if you like what you see, make sure you let them know. At the very least, let them know you like that they're supporting the network. At the end of the day, that's why we've been able to provide so much free content to you folks for 17 plus years. Yes, because of our sponsors. So, Get out there and thank them for keeping the content hose flowing your way. That's going to do it for us on the network today. Back again tomorrow with another great pro Q&A session. Then back again on Wednesday. You folks should definitely be checking out the Wednesday content. In particular, Options Boot Camp help you come to grips with a lot of these options terms we're throwing about here willy-nilly on the show. Back again on Thursday for the Option Block, as well as This Week in Futures Options, another show which touches on crypto. So check out that one if you are crypto curious. Back again on Friday if you like vol volatility views coming at you. Then, of course, for our pro folks who come back one final time for the week for a little bit of Options Oddities where we talk about unusual activity. Then we're off for the weekend. Isn't that nice? You're off. Except for crypto, of course. You have to keep paying attention. But for the rest of the markets, we're off. <laughs> then we're back again on Monday, another episode of the Crypto Rundown. Stay safe out there, everybody. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. 
Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 